All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our course, BC 106, on interpreting scripture. Welcome to everybody who's in the class. Um, let's pray and we'll get started. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this time to come and learn, study, and be equipped to rightly divide your word, to rightly handle your word. Father, we pray for the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. We pray for the Holy Spirit to be our teacher, to illuminate our hearts and minds, to teach us, to help us understand and God, to write these things upon the tables of our hearts so that we might live by them. And even as we serve people, uh, may we do it well. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Good morning, uh, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we have been looking at various uh, guidelines or instructions on how we must correctly interpret scripture. Last week, we spent time talking uh, about grammar, about looking at the meaning of the word or the meanings of the words and then interpreting it in the correct context. Right? So um, we went through some examples uh, on um, correctly interpreting words, uh, understanding the meaning, and then looking at how to uh, correctly interpret them. And the, some of the things, just quickly to review, some of the things we said is that sometimes in the Hebrew or in the Greek, a word could have multiple meanings. So you will have to choose the right meaning that's in that context. And also, sometimes the, the writer could have used it in more than one way. Right? So, so you try to bring all of those, all the understanding of that word into the explanation of the text so that we could you know, get a good understanding of the text. We, uh, we looked at some examples. Uh, for instance, the word pneuma is uh, in the Greek. It simply means wind, air, but that word pneuma is used to talk about the Holy Spirit, talk about the human spirit. It's also used to talk about evil spirit. Anything spirit is the Greek word pneuma. So depending on the context, you know, okay, this is talking about the Holy Spirit. It's talking about the human spirit or it's talking about evil spirit, pneuma. And then there are times, like we said, from Galatians chapter 5, where it may be a little, it may not be very obvious, very clear, whether he's referring to the Holy Spirit or to the human spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, meekness, goodness, temperance, faith. We said that. And um, we, we know in the context, he's talking about flesh versus spirit. Holy Spirit, but we also know that it is we who bear the fruit. So when he says the fruit of the Spirit, which Spirit is he spe specifically talking about? Is he talking about the Holy Spirit or is he talking about the human spirit? You know, and it is left open, meaning uh, both ways it could be right, right? If you say it is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, yeah, it is what the Holy Spirit produces in us. If we say it's the fruit of the human spirit, it is true. That is also true because it is we who bear the fruit, right? So in both ways, it's fine. And so uh, the right, I mean, the, the way I would approach it is to embrace both explanations because both are correct, right? So it's the Holy Spirit who produces that fruit through us, but we are the ones who will bear that fruit, right? So this, uh, we need to, uh, uh, understand. Like that, there are other words that we will need to study and uh, correctly interpret. 
today we're going to go forward and do a few other things. We'll see how, how much ground we cover. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share the notes uh, so that we can all see it. Today, <clears throat> we will go to lesson number seven, which is uh, we're going to talk about figures of speech. Figures of speech. That means it's a phrase or it's a part of a sentence that is usually a comparison. We say in English a simile or a comparison, where the comparison is not literal, but it's expressing or conveying a meaning. So, for instance, uh, in English, we would, uh, there are many, many uh, figures of speech we use. You know, we say, example, it's raining cats and dogs. So somebody say, hey, it's raining hard, it's raining cats and dogs. That doesn't mean cats and dogs are literally falling from the sky. That's not what we are literally meaning. What we are saying is very heavy. Right? Is this a phrase we use in English? It's for whatever reason. I don't know when it started, but it's been something people use. It's raining cats and dogs, you know. Or sometimes we say, that person, you know, say, oh man, he is such a pain in the neck. It doesn't mean you literally have pain in the neck. But what we are saying is that person, person is causing so much problem. So we say, oh, he's such a pain in the neck. It's a phrase. It doesn't, it's not literal. Right? So like that, there's so many examples. Now, in the Bible, also, there are such phrases. Because in every language, in every language, there are such phrases. And so if you know the language, uh, you know that when the person is using a phrase like this, a, it's a figure of speech, then you know it's not literal. They're not meaning it literally. They're just using a figure of speech, and you know what they actually mean. It's not the literal phrase, but you know what they actually are saying. Right? So that again, we have to be very careful when we uh, study the Word of God. And there are many such figures of speech. And uh, especially when it comes to prophetic scriptures. We will look at that separately, right? Where um, there are a lot of images, figures, and God uses that kind. You know, He uses pictures, He uses figures to speak to us. So, especially when it comes to prophetic text, you'll find a lot of figures, and then we have to interpret those correctly. We will come to that separately, but here I'm talking about general scripture, right? So, um, how do we know if an expression is figurative or literal? Right? How do we know it? Well, first, you see if the literal makes sense. If the literal does not make sense, then you know it's a figure of speech. So, for example, if somebody says it's raining cats and dogs, then what is the literal? Literal means cats and dogs are falling from the sky. Now, that doesn't make sense. So then you know that is a figure of speech. It's not a literal thing. Because the literal is not, cannot be real, cannot be factual. So it's a figure of speech. Right? So ex simple examples. Um, or, or secondly, the figurative uh, is intended if the literal would involve an impossible. In that it's, it's impossible for it, the literal thing. So, when John points to Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God, that doesn't mean Jesus was walking like a, you know, a lamb. No. <laughs> Jesus was a human, a God who became man. Right? But he was pointing to the man, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
and said, He is the Lamb of God. Now, definitely, that's figurative, right? He's he's saying this one is the Lamb of God. Does it mean he's a literal lamb? That's an impossibility. He's a man, he's human, walking as a man. But he is going to do or he's going to fulfill what the Lamb of God would fulfill. So it's figurative. Right? Or when God tells Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1.18, he says, Jeremiah, I have made you an iron pillar and a brass wall. It's figure of speech. It doesn't mean Jeremiah is like a pillar. Suddenly he becomes like a pillar or he becomes like a wall. No. What God is saying is, I have made you so strong, you know, nobody can push you down, right? I made you an iron pillar. I made you like a solid raised brass wall. Nobody can, you know, uh, push you down. So, or you might see, you know, in Isaiah 55, it says, the trees of the field will clap their hands. So God is telling his people, you will go out with joy. You will be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into singing. And the trees of the field will clap their hands. That is not literal. It is figurative. Meaning God is going to bring you uh, out with such great, there will be joy rejoicing everywhere. The mountains will clap their hands and the trees of the field will clap their hands. The mountains will sing for joy. It's figurative. Right? Uh, so it's not literal. It's God is conveying a meaning. Right? Or uh, so that where the literal is is not is not no is not factual. It's it, it would be absurd. Or number four, uh, we understand that a figurative figurative sense, if the literal would demand, uh, you know some strange action for example jesus said unless you eat my flesh in this is in john 6 unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood you have no part in me so you imagine a preacher preaching like a sermon like this so he's got thousands of people listening to him and he tells them unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood I said, what? <laughs> what does he say? You know, uh, so obviously he's not meaning literal that they will chop his body and everybody get little piece, <laughs> or you know, get a little. It it won't be enough for the thousands of people anyway. And he's not talking about something literal. That would be, you know, terrible. But what he's talking about, he explains it later. It's like you being a part of me, you know, being. Coming into union, spiritual union with Jesus Christ, you know, abiding in Him, living by His Word. That's those are the things He's actually meaning. It means you become so much a part of Him. Right? So the literal would be just uh, uh, you know it's not not normal. Or uh, sometimes you'll find in Scripture, and also this is also true about prophetic Scripture, that a figurative expression is used, but then the context will tell you what the literal meaning is. Example, in 1 Thessalonians 4, it talks about those who fall asleep. Then in that same passage, it talks about those who have died in Christ. Those who have fallen asleep, God will bring with him. Right Now, some people... They have taken that phrase, fallen asleep, and they've made a doctrine out of it. They, it's like, oh, when you die, you, it's like sleeping. Your body is there, your spirit is there. But that's wrong. Because you look in the rest of Scripture, when you die, if a believer dies, his spirit goes to be with Jesus. He doesn't sleep there. Right? Paul said, to me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. Why? Because I'm going to go be with Jesus. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Very clear. He's not sleeping somewhere here in the ground. 
spirit is not sleeping. Hmm? The spirit goes to be with Jesus. Very clear. But some people will take the figurative phrase used in 1 Thessalonians 4 and they come up with this doctrine of when a person dies, their spirit is sleeping somewhere in the ground. Crazy, no? Because it, they're not interpreting it correctly. That's a figurative phrase. In the context, it's very clear that the, their spirit has gone, a believer's spirit has gone up to be with the Lord, and the spirit is coming with the Lord. And they will receive glorified bodies. And you have to look at other passages of scripture. You're understanding this? Yeah? Figure, figure of speech or simile or a comparison, right? That's also there in scripture text. So how do we interpret these things? Right? So first of all, uh, recognize that uh, there is a figure of speech being used. Right? So many, so many New Testament examples, some more examples. Uh, Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 6. Paul talks about the Christian as being a soldier. Yeah. So if you say, I am a soldier, I'm carrying a gun, every believer must carry a gun, keep on gun and say, then that is applying a figure incorrectly. Paul never intended for believers to go around with arms, you know, whatever the gun or knife or whatever. Somebody say, hey, why are you carrying a gun? Paul said, I am a soldier. <laughs> Finish. <laughs> That's not what he meant. He's using a figure. He's using an example. You're like a soldier. You have to be disciplined and committed like that. Or athlete or farmer. So these are pictures, figures he's using for a Christian, for a believer. Right? So it's not literal. So you recognize, hey, okay. And, uh, or example, Matthew 7, 6, Jesus said, do not give dogs, yeah, what is sacred, don't throw pearls before pigs. Now, nobody's going to literally go, here, take my chain, pig, let me put it around you. <laughs> nobody's going to do that in the right mind. Nobody will do it. So he's not talking about something literal, right? He's using that as a figure, example. Just like nobody will go and throw their necklace or give their costly pearl necklace to a pig. He says, don't give your spiritual things, which are very precious. Don't give it, don't throw it, or don't put it in front of people who will have no value for it. Don't waste your time doing that. Right? So, so understand. Uh, that there is a figure of speech involved. And then uh, try to, you know, and this is actually very simple. We, we, we do it automatically in our minds. Number two, the image and the non-image. That means the image, what is the picture? And who is it, who is that being applied to? Example, lamb is the image. Jesus is the non-image. I mean, the lamb, the the picture of the lamb is being applied to Jesus. So image, non-image, right? So the believer, uh, uh, the soldier is the image. The believer is a non-image. So the picture of a soldier is applied to a believer. Right? So image, non-image. So understand that. And uh, and so on. Yeah. So example, in John 2, 19, Jesus says, Destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. So people didn't understand it. When, they, when Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. They said, what are you saying? This temple took more than 40 years to build. You are saying you destroyed some three days, you'll build it. But then he was talking about the temple of his body. He was not talking about the physical temple. So he's saying, you destroy this temple, three days it will come back. Right? So they didn't understand that. But here, temple is the image. His body is the non-image. He's using that actually to refer to his body, himself. Right? So 
very important. Number three is understand what is the point of the comparison. What is the comparison, right? So uh, in Psalm 1, we're using that example here. God says, you know, a person who meditates in his word, he will be like a tree planted by the rivers of what? His, uh, his leaf will not wither. Whatever he does will prosper. So he will be like a tree, like a tree. Comparison, figure of speech. So what is, what is God trying to convey through that picture? In this particular case, he's trying to say that a person who meditates in his word, he will be prosperous, he'll be flourishing, he'll be well watered, like that tree, fruitful, like that. So he's, he's giving a picture of uh, fruitfulness, of prosperity, of flourishing. And he's saying that's the life of a person who meditates in his word. So that's the point uh, that we must bring across from the image to the non-image. Sean? Sir, can we take uh, Revelation 3rd chapter verse uh, 15? Was uh, was fifteen to uh, sixteen as an example, where he talks about like how you should not be either hot or cold. And, I mean, mm. you should be the hot or cold and not lukewarm. Others will spit you out. Mm. Yeah. Can you take that as an example for speakers of speech? Yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah. So there are many, many such examples, right? Where you find many in the Bible. In fact, uh, where so many comparisons. So it's not literal. It's not like Jesus is. Is uh, vomiting all of us, you know. Yeah, it's a figure of speech. So I will, I will vomit you out, right? Basically, saying I, I just can't, you know, not tolerate such things. So that's the point of comparison. Okay. So many, uh, many such comparisons. Uh, number four: Do not assume that a figure always means the same thing, right? So. Uh, the same figure can mean different things in different situations. Right? Example, we know uh, the lion. In one case, the lion talking about authority, boldness, dominion used for Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah. In another case, the lion talking about stealth, how, how he surprises his attacks is used for the devil. He's like a roaring lion. Right? So the points of comparison are different. The same image is used, but the points are different. Sean? Uh, in, uh, I think he also told us that we should be cunning like a snake. In, uh, certain, when he talks about how we should be as believers, we should be gentle as a dove, and we should be cunning as a snake. Mm. So, yeah, in that context, is telling like you should have that characteristic of a snake. Whereas in different contexts, you say that, uh, you know, uh, it calls Satan as you snake. Like that. Right. Yeah. So snake, right? It's used for different things, right? So a snake can be used for a believer in a good sense, be wise as serpents. A snake can be used to talk about the devil. The snake in the Bible is also used to talk about evil men. You know, they are, their tongue is like snake in Psalms. You know, about that. So the context, the same image is used for three different things. Right? Devils, believer being wise, evil men doing their cunning works. Right? So different things like that. So, so, yeah, so the same figure, point number four, the same figure could mean different things in different places. Number five. Number five. Very important. Place limits on the figure. On what points you transfer from the figure to from the image to the non-image. Example, Jesus, Lamb of God. Oh, Lamb has four feet. So Jesus, something you say. Lamb has wool. Jesus has wool or something. So then what happens is we are 
transferring points from the image to the non-image, which is not intended. Basically, when John says he's a lamb of God, meaning he's going to be like the lamb in the Old Testament, we offer as a sin offering, as an offering for sin, the spotless lamb of God. Perfect lamb offered as a sin offering. But we should not transfer other points of comparison, like four legs, wool, or tail. This, that full confusion. Very full confusion. Right? And there are many examples here. I just mentioned a couple. But Jesus said, I will come like a thief. I will come like a thief. Now, of course, what's the point of comparison? He'll come unannounced. So thief never says, hey, tonight I'm coming to your house. 10 o'clock I'm coming to steal something. He never says that. He'll come unannounced when we least expect. That's the point of comparison. So when, 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 when the Bible says the Lord will come like a thief in the night, the point of comparison is he's coming unannounced. Now, if some people say, hey, Bible said, Jesus is like a thief. He'll come to steal, kill, and destroy from you. Wrong. That image is used for the devil. The devil is a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But when the Bible says that the Lord will come like a thief in the night, the point is he's coming unannounced when we don't expect. But we should not extend that image for other things. Oh, he will come suddenly to scare you and he will, you know, he'll steal from you, those kind of, no, don't do all that. Right? So things, you know, and there's so many examples. Uh, in Job 9, for instance, the Bible talks about the pillars of the earth tremble. Of course, there are no pillars. The earth is round. It's floating in space. It's not resting on pillars. So there you have to say, okay, that's just a figure of speech. It's not meant literally, right? It just means the foundation, the thing, the very core of the earth, right? Um, and so on. Let me just see if there are any questions from uh, students who are online. All right, any questions? All right. Jack. Jakin, Jakin. Hope I pronounced the name correctly. Jakin. As a um, question, as we're learning about figurative speech, so will it help when we refer our dictionary and check the true actual meaning of a fortified city, iron pillar, and bronze wall to a to a building or nation to correlate, bring to imagine to what depth the Jeremiah's call from God was? Um, okay, interesting question. So, what would help? Ears to look at the figure of speech. First of all, you start with the original context. So uh, start with the Hebrew or the Greek and start with what would this mean in that given context, right? So if you look at that, so uh, because remember, it was written in that language, in that culture, and in that context. So when we want to look at the background, go back to the Hebrew or go back to the Greek and say, for example, when we, when we say Jesus was Lamb of God, generally, if you go to the English dictionary, the English dictionary might say Lamb, or oh, Mary had a little lamb, or it may talk about you know innocence and childishness or whatever. But the correct understanding of that figure comes only from the biblical context, or oh, Lamb of God. What is the context? For that, you go back into the Old Testament. Or oh, in the Old Testament, you know, they had to bring a sin offering, right? So that gives us a more accurate interpretation of that figure uh, as opposed to going to an English dictionary. So that would be my answer. Just stay, you know, uh, there's nothing wrong in using an English dictionary, of course, you use it for its purpose. But uh, in interpreting biblical figures, it's always good to stay within the biblical context and uh, uh, biblical context, the language and the culture in which it was written, which would be Hebrew, Greek, and so on. Okay, but very good question. 
Any other questions from those on online? Any questions from those in person? Um, let me. See. Uh, what what is it, Anand? Sorry. Um, so okay. So the question here is, um, oh, do not give what is holy to dogs. Yeah. So don't throw. Like don't give. So the context here. He's talking about spiritual things. So don't give spiritual things to those who will not value it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's basically like so if somebody's not interested in listening, don't go and force force it on them. You know, they won't value it. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to reach them. You pray for them, you share, but then you understand, you know, there's no point in you know, example, less practical example. Suppose there's somebody who's not interested. I'm not going to go buy you know, a huge Bible and say, hey, you have to read it. They won't value it. They might just throw it off. So we might feel, oh, I've done a big thing. But they may just discard it. They may not value it. right? So that's you can apply it practically like that. Yeah. Sean? Uh, so same, about the same verse. And at which point of time do you think like uh, it feels like you're uh, throwing uh, pearls in front of pigs like which point you feel that way like yeah so uh, when do we judge it so suppose you're reaching out to some somebody and they reject they push back right so then you know they're not open yet so what we have to do is to pray for their heart to be opened so when they're pushing back when they're saying don't talk to me that's not the time to go and give them 10 tracts yeah that's like you're throwing pearls before science right that's the time to just go and pray for them. And that's the time to show, demonstrate through your life. You know, they can never prevent your life from speaking. Right? They may reject the tracts, they may reject the Bible, but they can never prevent your life from speaking to them. Right? So if somebody says, hey, don't talk to me about it, I'm not interested, respect that. Um, that's the time to realize, you know, I, I can pray for them. I can live my life in front of them. They'll, they'll always see my life. You know, they may not read a tract or a Bible or a book that I give, but they're always seeing my life. So then at some point later, when their heart is open, when they are receptive, then that's the time you can, you know, talk to them or give them something that they're willing to receive. Okay, so we should be sensitive and be respectful of people. Fine. So that was on figures of speech. Okay, let's. Uh, so that's one. Let me close this figure of speech. Yeah. Huh? Question. Okay. Sorry. Say that again. Proverbs. Proverbs twenty six, and verse number four. Four and five. Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. It says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest, lest you also be like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So, here's, here's a place, here's an example where it's basically like, no matter what you tell a fool, it's not going to matter. Right? If you, verse 4, if you speak at his level, you're making a fool of yourself. You're coming down to his level. If you speak, uh, you know, something that's really wise, then what's going to happen? He's going to think that, oh, he is so smart. In other words, a fool never understands. He never gets it. So don't waste your time. If you go down to his level, you're spoiling yourself. If you speak like a wise man, you're elevating him. He feels great. In other words, don't waste your time. He's not going to get it. Just leave him alone. That's the point. 
got it uh so like um, most most of the most, some new testament like parables and all that are easy to interpret but when it comes to like uh, old testament when it comes to like isaiah or ecclesiastes like for example in ecclesiastes fourth chapter was uh, four to six he, he says that i've also learned why people work so hard to succeed is because they envy their neighbors but it is useless is like chasing the wind they say that a man would be a fool to fold his hands and let himself starve to death perhaps so but it is better to have only a little with peace of mind than to be busy all the time with both hands trying to catch the wind so how do you interpret something like this uh, which verses are you looking at uh, uh, ecclesiastes 4 chapter verse uh, 4 to 6 okay so well first is we need to understand the book of ecclesiastes right that means this was written by king solomon when he was in his bad state. So King Solomon began when he was very wise. That was the book of Proverbs. So a lot of wisdom there. Then he went into a decline, spiritual, moral decline. He went in a very bad state. So this book of Ecclesiastes is written during that time. So that's why he makes certain statements which are an expression of a person in a bad state. He says, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Now, that is not a true statement, right? Meaning, he's saying everything is vain. No, everything is not vain because what God created is good. You understand that? So, when we read the book of Ecclesiastes, we have to understand uh, the context, who is writing, when he was writing it, and then interpret that in the rest of the light of scripture. So the basic rule which we learned in the very beginning, every passage of scripture has to be interpreted in the light of the rest of scripture. So whatever you read in Ecclesiastes has to be interpreted in the light of the rest of scripture, not independently. Like you don't take four verses and say, hey, what is the meaning of it? Well, this meaning has to be interpreted in the rest of rest. So that's how we would handle the book of Ecclesiastes. So not only these verses, but the whole book, understanding that Solomon was writing, and it's really an expression of what had happened in his life. You know, so there's a reason why books like the Book of Ecclesiastes or the Song of Solomon is there in Scripture, uh, re revealing certain things to us and how God works even in those situations. Okay. Yes, Anna. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the word of God in the Bible, right? The word is compared to many things fire, hammer, honey, uh, rock, bread, water. So there are all these images of the word. So you follow the rules we just learned, right? So when it's like bread, what is the point of comparison? What would it be? Yeah, it, it satisfies our hunger. Milk. The word of God is like milk. What is the point? You know, come point, point. So we have to think logically. But there's one point of comparison. Fire. It burns chaff. It ignites, depending on the context. In this particular case, Jeremiah, he's talking about God's prophetic word was burning inside him. He couldn't contain it. He had to speak it. In another place, fire would be, it burns up the chaff. In Jeremiah, again, in Jeremiah 23, God says, my word is like fire. It burns up the chaff. My word is like hammer. It breaks what's hard. Right? So all these are figures, images. And we have to logically bring out the point of comparison. Okay. So Holy Spirit, so many symbols. You know, he's like rain. He's like water. He's like fire. He's like a dove. You know, all these are figures for the Holy Spirit. Now you have to bring out the point of comparison. Is it okay to use uh, pictures? Yeah. So, for example, you know, in many uh, logos, 
you'll they'll put a you'll see a picture of a dao. Then we all understand dao represents holy spirit, or they'll see fire, or you'll see, and because you see a cross, you see a Bible. Uh, these are just a picture communicates something. So there's nothing wrong in using uh, those symbols or those pictures. You're communicating something. It's perfectly fine. Yeah, but usually nobody uses hammer. But hammer means the word of God is like a hammer or sword. Some people use sword. God's word is like a sword. Um, yeah, so it's perfectly fine to use those. Okay, let's move forward. Now, we're going to talk about types and shadows. So, chapter 8. Okay, let me just, sorry, share my, share my. So, type and shadow. Let me just introduce this. We'll go for a break and come back. Now, imagine you see, you're seeing the shadow of a tree. Okay, of course you can see some shadows here. You can see the shadow of a desk and a chair. Uh, but imagine you're seeing the shadow of a tree. Now when you see the shadow of a tree, very often you recognize what that shadow represents. That means there is a tree. There is a literal tree. And you can see the shadow and say, oh, this shadow looks like a tree. You can recognize what the literal is through this by looking at the shadow. But there are limitations in the shadow. By looking at the shadow, can you tell what color leaves are on the tree? No. By looking at the shadow, we may not be all we may not always be able to tell details. How many branches, how many leaves? what color, what color the flowers are, what color the fruit is. Maybe you can say, if there was fruit hanging and you see round things or whatever, you can, maybe you can say a little bit about what fruit, what kind of fruit is on the tree, but otherwise you won't know. So there are limitations with the shadow. The shadow is, has resemblance, but it doesn't give all the details. And the shadow is pointing to the literal. And when, then when you come to the tree, then you can see so much more. Oh, the tree is actually so big. The tree has green leaves, so many branches, fruit, flowers, this, that. And all. The, all the literal things you can, the details you see when you actually come in front of the tree. Got it. So, in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, there are many what we refer to as type or shadow or prefigures. So, when somebody says type, shadow or prefigure, it's like it's pointing to something. It's pointing to the literal. Right? So, when you come into the New Testament, that's where you see the reality, you see the fulfillment, you see the literal. Okay, type and Shadow. Um, examples. Okay, so let's go into the details. The type, or you say the shadow or the figure, that the prefiguring, it has some resemblance, like we saw. It has some similarity, it's pointing to something. It has historical reality, that means. Those things actually happened, or were there, that person was there, or that thing happened, that event happened. It's a prefiguring. It is showing ahead of time something. God uses that to show, point to something else of the literal that was to come. Uh, there is also a heightening, meaning, like we said, heightening means details. Details come in the literal, in the actual uh, person or the literal. but. The, the literal has much more details than the shadow. Okay. 
types have divine design. That means God said. Okay, it's not something you and I pick up. So I can't go and say, David is a type of Christ. If I say that, it's wrong. Because it's not mentioned. But when God says something, when God said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, when Jesus himself said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so will the Son of Man. Now, the Lord is pointing to something in Scripture. That's a true type. So, for a type, it has to be divine. design. means it has to be mentioned in the Bible. You and I cannot go and simply say, this is a type. You understand it? So the New Testament must say that represents this. Example, Passover lamb. Why do we say the Passover lamb represents Jesus? Because the New Testament explicitly says, 1 Corinthians 5, Christ of a Passover is sacrificed for us. So that is a divine design. The scripture is pointing to it. So some people say, David represents Jesus, Goliath represents Satan. Now that is wrong. That's not the way to preach and teach the word of God, right? Because that is not mentioned in the Bible. Now, nobody's going to stone you for saying that. People will clap and say hallelujah. But that is not the correct way to preach and teach the word of God. Because that is not given in scripture. Uh, there's coming up, another lesson is coming up on allegorizing. All right? That it means we are assigning things, meaning to things that God never intended. That's allegorizing. And we shouldn't do it. Right? We'll come to that chapter later. But the point I want to point out is a type and a shadow is stated in Scripture. Because it's stated in Scripture, we say it. Example, we can say Melchizedek is a type of Christ. Why? Because the writer of Hebrews states it. So we're not simply making it up. Right? If the writer of Hebrews never said that, and we say, we, if it was not stated, and we simply came and said, oh, Melchizedek is a type of Christ, then that would be wrong because it's not stated, if it, if it was not stated. But because it is stated, we can say Melchizedek is a type of Christ. You're getting it? Right? Or we can say the rock that Moses struck is a type of Christ. Why? Because it's stated in 1 Corinthians 10. That rock is Christ. It's stated. So that the rock now becomes a type. A type of Christ. You understand? So we see many like this. I'm just giving you a few. But point number five, divine design, meaning it has been explicitly stated in design number six. I combine the two. It's designated by God. We will look at some examples. Okay. So there are three things I want us to keep in mind. We'll I'll mention this, we'll go for a break. There are types, illustrations, and there are there is allegorizing. Allegorizing is something you should not do. Okay. But we're mentioning it here uh, as an example of what we should not do. Okay. Let's go for a break. We'll come back and I'll explain this. Okay. Uh, further. Let's go for a break. Thank you.